So the quickest thing you can say to anyone who asks you about, well, what's a gamma ray? It's, uh, it's, it's the shortest wavelength of light. It carries the most energy. Um, so an important thing about that is, well, that means that it's the scale of it. It's very tiny, and so you should have in your mind, we're talking about scales that are on par or smaller than atomic nuclei. Um, so the kinds of you know, physics that we're looking at with these can come from you know, very small places with very um, kind of intense states of matter. And so some of the things going on in it aren't what you get to see in visible or even in x-ray. So it's a very special wavelength for that reason. You just don't access the same physics. And that's sort of what's shown along this middle line where you're seeing the different kind of size scales. Um, the other thing to note is a lot of times um, when I talk to astronomers who don't do the high energy side up here, you know, they're concerned about like the temperature of an object, and they want to know what temperature our objects are. And I'm like, I don't know how to tell you that because we're kind of off the temperature scale. Because you're not talking about something that is hot, like a star anymore, or something that is burning, or something that is, you know, heated up gas. You're actually talking about where different things come into play to produce the radiation, where something different is happening to the matter. And so that's no longer just heating it up. That's like a state change in the plasma. Um, so this is one of the reasons the gamma rays are fun and really special. Um, the thing that is hard is that going back to the very top of the slide, you can ask the question, does this wavelength of light penetrate the Earth's atmosphere? Um, and fortunately for us, visible does. We get to enjoy the beauty of the sky. We don't just look up and to the limits of the atmosphere. Um, but in other places, uh, we do. And for example, in X-rays and gamma rays, um, for the most part, you can't do those on the ground. There's some exceptions for the really high energy gamma rays that I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but you have to put something up in space. So something that is really special that we have access to now that we didn't use to is the ability to put telescopes up into space, to put um, sensors up there. Yeah. Yeah. The gamma ray band itself encompasses orders of magnitude and wavelength. And so when you see that picture and it has like a full happy electromagnetic spectrum and everyone's sort of parceled out, it's actually this entire other half of it is all up in gamma rays. Um, and so it's just an amazing part of the spectrum that only for the last few decades have we been able to start to dig into. Um, and I'm going to use the term, I'm not going to talk about the wavelength of the light anymore, I'm always going to talk about energy. Because once you get up um, to this, these kind of wavelengths, the things that matter do it, it doesn't matter anymore what the wavelength is. You're always talking about the energy and is it, and it's, you know, is it energy in a photon state or is it matter and you can think about the mass of it and it can convert back and forth. Um, and so I'm always, when I'm talking about high energy, it also means high frequency, and I'll do that throughout the talk. So we are not talking about starlight anymore. So you may wonder at this point how I can give you guys a tour of the sky um, when you are very uh, experts in many cases in looking at starlight. Um, well, we're going to go beyond that. <clears throat> and this is a fun thing about what we do, because we're talking about the most energetic matter you can find anywhere. Um, this is where Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared matters. Um, because I'm not just talking about matter that's sitting on a star or maybe it's whizzing through space. No, I'm talking about matter that has been broken into bits and sped up close to the speed of light. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you'd like to do in a collider on the Earth, but you can't even because we're constrained by you know, the magnets that we can use and the facilities we have. The things we can look at, um, the matter and the, the energy it has, exceed what we can do on the ground. So it's a whole different way to study physics, which is fun. Um, and the other thing is, well, this is the reason that, you know, thank particle physics, we now know how to detect gamma rays. And that's because we can kind of go the other direction. Um, when you have matter moving at close to the speed of, of light, it can generate gamma rays. Um, when you have gamma rays and they run into matter, then they release their energy. And you can tell that they've been there. They sort of leave footprints that you can follow. Um, and so the, the weirdest thing about gamma rays is that I will not show you any lenses or reflectors or mirrors because gamma rays go right through them. You just kind of leave energy deposits. We actually have to have enough stuff that the gamma rays crash into it, leave this energy footprints, and then we figure out what happened. Um, so it's entirely different from how most other telescopes work. All right, to give you um, just a sense of that, I'm gonna show you um, a movie. So this is um, an animation of uh, a gamma ray coming into the Fermi Large Area Telescope, and then what happens? Let me get it started here. Um, so we're going to zoom in a little bit. There's going to be a cutaway. We have all these layers of sensors that go through that box. When the gamma ray comes in, you're going to see suddenly it changes. 
And now we have uh, some charged particles that are traveling through this instrument. Uh, one is positive, one is negative. And we can look at their tracks from the energy that's left and point back to where they came from in the sky. So this, in the simplest terms, is how this telescope works, is that you essentially have to destroy the gamma ray, look at this energy that kind of cascades through these sensitive planes, and then kind of sort of make a, a cone, point back in the sky, and then you know two things. And this is what you need for astronomy, right? You need to know where it happened in the sky, and you need to know what the, what the energy was, what the wavelength was. And so once we get a position and an energy, then we can really start doing astronomy. And so this has been the work in gamma rays for decades, is can we get that information precisely enough to really start doing astronomy? Um, fortunately, we can. Um, this is um, a fairly up-to-date version of the high-energy gamma ray sky, taken with the instrument I just showed you, the Large Area Telescope. And this is, again, a weird picture, because I think a lot of you are used to, you're looking at a chart of the sky, and sometimes it's even a fairly broad piece. Um, when you look through your telescope, it becomes a very narrow piece, right? And this is where we've made a projection of the entire sky folded out. Uh, because with our telescope up in space, and because the gamma rays come in from all directions into this box, you have an enormous field of view. It's kind of like when you look up at the sky with your eyes. That kind of cone is sort of the size of the field of view of this telescope at any instant. It's something like two star radians. Um, so you're always kind of sweeping out this huge swath of sky, which is also very different if you're used to thinking about Hubble. This is like the anti-Hubble. Hubble was this very narrow field of view that was very deep into the universe. We want to just like map everything and capture it as it happens. So the map you're looking at, it takes, us, it takes us a while to do that. Now, if you're reading ahead, you've noticed that I'm showing you seven years of data that we've collected. And so when we make this map, we've essentially stacked up all of our best photons in a single image. And so we've, this was at the point, now Fermi's been up there for almost 12 years. So this is using seven years of our data. Um, we've stacked it all up. Now, if you're really paying attention, you might think it looks just a little funny or fuzzy, or, or if you've better eyesight than I do anyway, um, a little bit kind of smoothed, maybe? Anyone getting that vibe? And this is. We've actually smoothed this a bit. Um, because we see such a broad range of energy in this telescope, we have to adjust a little bit as we stack it. And a nice way to do that is to kind of wait with the wavelength we're looking at and create this, this smoothed image. And I'm doing that not to misrepresent the data, but to bring out some of the features that we're going to talk about. Um, so we're going to come back to this map, and this is kind of your first introduction to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is we have to collect a lot of photons to be able to do this. This is something like 700,000 of them. And then and the thing that I won't show you is that to get those photons, we have thrown away something like 100 times that many, uh, and not, not all photons. We get all kinds of radiation that strikes our spacecraft all the time up in space. Maybe you've you know, heard about the cosmic rays and things like that. And so our data is very heavily processed. This looks like a very nice, simple map, and oh, you just kind of connect the lines, point back. We actually have a whole computing farm out at, um, at SLAC, the Linear Collider Facility in California near Stanford. And we run something like you know 1,000 computers at a time to go through this data set look at all the little bits of energy information, and then create these maps. Yep. So one thing I want to show you is just how we add up that map, because we're counting these photons from all over the sky. And so what I'm going to show you is different frames, starting from 30 days of exposure, and then doubling for each step until we get to that seven-year map. And so you can kind of see how the features start to rise out of the map. So remember, we're starting from 30 days a month. Um, and you're going to see this evolve, and you see the picture start to get deeper and deeper. And you'll see these features coming out. And you start to see speckles, spots, this big streak across the middle. And everything sharpens up over time. And part of that reason is the, the light that we see that has the best resolution is at the highest energy, but that's also the, the rarest. So the longer we look, we actually get sharper because we keep adding the photons that are at the very highest energies that we can see. Um, and so that's how we, we actually have to add all that up over time to get that beautiful picture. Okay, so now I'm going to switch the picture. Has anyone ever seen a, a full sky image in the optical band? Okay, because you guys, you know, so I, I had to hunt around a bit and get oriented to this. But um, so the first one that I found, and this was some years back when I was thinking about how to talk about you know, the optical sky versus the gamma ray sky was this beautiful projection of the optical catalog that is hand-drawn. 
Um, this is credited to the London Observatory, and which just amazes me that someone took that care in translating this catalog into this galactic projection. Um, so it's the same projection as the gamma ray map that I showed you. And you can see it looks, eh, some things are similar. We've got the bright streak that's across our Milky Way. Um, we have some bright spots up and below. Um, you can see the Magellanic Cloud. Um, but it also looks a bit different. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit um, as we do our tour of the sky. Um, now, I had to show you the better view. So this was really exciting then. I don't know if you all have heard of Gaia. Um, this is a European project that has been up mapping the optical sky, um, essentially up to, you know, the goal of measuring you know, billions of stars in the galaxy. And um, they have this beautiful image out that is um, both the intensity for the optical light and there's color information in here for red and blue. Um, and I don't know their, their filters in detail, so that would um, But I thought I should show you that because one of the things that's always notable, I think, when we see the galaxy and optical is those cloudy regions, right? You see all those um, cloudy regions where it feels like, you know, it's kind of veiling some of the stars from us. Um, and so one of the most interesting things, I think, looking between, and something I started thinking a lot about, you know, 10 years ago, well, 15, I guess, um, is how you don't see that same kind of cloudy structure in the gamma rays. Like, everything is kind of bright and cutting through. And that's because gamma rays are more penetrating than optical light. They go through more. Um, so for objects that we do see gamma rays from, they don't get blocked out in the same way that the optical light does. Um, which is a really interesting and sometimes very helpful feature because you can see a bit deeper into an object. Um, you can see some things um, that are far away and kind of beaming radiation towards us where the optical and eh, maybe, you know, not so interesting with the gamma is to stand out and kind of and hit us over the head. Um, and so that's a real difference, but you'll see that kind of that shape of the clouds is kind of in kind of the red, broad shape on the horizontal plane of this map on the gamma rays. And that is real and that was expected. Because one of the ways that we see gamma rays is that we know that um, the space is filled with cosmic radiation, not just light, but also uh, little bits of matter, cosmic rays, that have been sped up in explosions close to the speed of light. We measure the ones that strike the Earth directly, but we know that they're filling the galaxy. And when these cosmic rays run into material, clouds, dust, objects in general, um, any kind of matter, they produce gamma rays. And so the gamma rays are our messenger of what is happening to cosmic rays throughout our galaxy. And that's interesting because the cosmic rays um, carry about a third of the energy in any galaxy. So when you're thinking about how galaxies form, um, how they evolve over time, you know, think about the stars, think about the dark matter, we don't think about the dark matter component of the galaxies, Think about the cosmic rays, which are the way that energy can transport itself um, throughout the galaxy. Um, and so we see that in our galaxy. We see that it's all lit up. Um, you see these nice features. Um, and then the other thing, you'll see that the brightness is varying across as you come across horizontally. And so remember that our galaxy has this spiral structure that, that we have to infer, right? Because we can't actually look down on our galaxy. So what I'm showing you at the top is an illustration you know, of um, and this was from, let's see, I credited it, and it was from the NASA Solar System page. Um, and it does some nice things. It shows you where our sun is relative to that bulge in the center. Um, it's kind of lying below at the hub of that, you should see sort of that wheel coming out maybe faintly. And that's where our sun is. So we're looking, so we're in the outside of, outskirts of our galaxy looking towards the center. Um, and then, so when you're looking down those arms of the galaxy, the spiral arms, you have to imagine sort of tipping that image over. And then you're going to see um, some areas that there aren't as many stars, for example, and then these areas of the arms that have all the stars and all the gas. Um, and that's sort of where the interesting things in our galaxy is happening. And so that's where you see kind of these kind of clumpy regions on either side of this image and kind of the width of the yellow part changing. That's lined up with the arms of our galaxy. Um, and some parts of our galaxy are closer than others, so those are going to be brighter and bigger. Um, and then that's also why you sort of see um, the other thing I should point out before we get further in this map is that the whole map is a color. Some of it's blue, some of it's red, some of it's yellow. You know, yellow is where the most gamma rays are coming from, the highest intensity, but blue, we see gamma rays from the entire sky. Um, and even if you start resolving those out, you couldn't see that, oh, everything's just blurred over the sky. You know, if you start resolving it out, gamma rays are coming to us from the distant universe. 
um, at the level of you don't see the individual objects anymore, but you see the glow of them. And so the whole sky glows in gamma rays, and it's actually telling us about kind of this journey of light from some of the earliest objects in the universe. Um, well, the earliest ones producing gamma rays, I should say. Now, you may have noticed um, that there's this weird sort of hourglass kind of shape going on above, above and below where the galactic center is in the center of this picture. And it looks sort of like bubbles. Um, and in fact, that is what we named it. We called it the Fermi Bubbles. And this is an entirely new feature of our galaxy that we never knew was there until Fermi was able to see these gamma rays. And when people found it, we were really excited because it means something exciting happened in the past. Now, this again is an illustration so you can get a sense of the size of these bubbles and it's kind of made them more symmetric than they look like. They're huge. These are 50,000 light years across. <coughs> Uh, so in other words, they're coming out of the plane of the galaxy so far that if you took them and just kind of tipped them on their side, they would come out to the distance the sun is from the center of our galaxy. So they're huge. Um, and they are centered uh, in the center of our galaxy. So you might ask yourself, you know, what, what happened to kind of blow this big bubble of energy? Um, and there are two ideas about this. One is that there was some activity in the black hole in the center of our galaxy in the past. Um, one idea is, well, another thing we know about the center of our galaxy is, you know, it's bright, there are a lot of stars there. Um, and there's been different eras of star formation that happened. And what, you know, maybe in the past, there was this really um, intense uh, period of star formation that kind of blew a lot of wind and particles and energy out into these bubbles. Um, and so right now, astronomers are arguing about these ideas and using information in other wavelengths as well as looking at other galaxies to try and figure out what happened. Um, but something happened in the life of our galaxy um, in the distant past. Um, and this is, 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 has left, and it's left this footprint for us to find. Some of the places that we've looked for these are thought about, and we're not really able to do it. Um, does anyone know the Andromeda Galaxy? It is a gamma ray object in our catalog. Um, and here's what it looks like. <laughs> and so I took it, and you can see those contours, those faint black lines in the middle that are overlaid. Those are coming from the um, either optical or infrared imaging of the galaxy. Um, so you can kind of see where those spirals of Andromeda are compared to the gamma rays. And so when I tell you that in gamma rays we always have this problem of not having the same resolution as other telescopes, this is the problem. <laughs> oh, but it's sort of like in gamma rays, we have like it's amazing glasses, but they aren't the same resolution as other telescopes. So a lot of objects to us, we don't resolve all the features. Um, that's a project for future generations. But there's more information than you think there is. There's a really cool thing about Andromeda, though, because one of the things we look at is can we predict the um, gamma rays that we see coming from the Milky Way? And so we make models and try and make it match our data. And we actually find more gamma rays, so excluding the bubbles that I showed you, if you look at the center of our galaxy, there are gamma rays coming from the center of our galaxy that we're not sure how to explain from that central region. Um, and so you, so you can see, like, well, we're not going to see bubble features here, and let's forget the bubbles for a moment. A thing we can tell from this data when we do careful processing of it is that the shape of it in the gamma rays, as blurry as it is, still isn't what we would expect if the gamma rays were actually coming from all along the plane of that galaxy from the cosmic ray interactions it's more centralized than we would expect. So you can do some mathematical testing and say like, okay, is that distribution closer to something out along with the spirals or something more center dominated? And it's more center dominated. Um, and this is interesting because one of the things that um, we try to do with gamma rays is look for dark matter. Uh, because one of the cool particle things you can do with models of dark matter is there's, there's a formulation you can make for dark matter that could run into itself and produce gamma rays. So when Fermi launched, people were really excited for Fermi to go and look for dark matter. And so I will give away to you now that we have not found it. Um, but we have looked all the places that people had in mind in a way that we now have learned a lot. Um, because those simplest models um, don't work. But something that when I say that there are extra gamma rays then coming from the center of our galaxy and from the center of Andromeda, people are thinking very hard about how to explain that. Is it from objects that aren't in our model? just normal astrophysical objects? Could there be a dark matter component that is subtle enough it's been hard for us to pick out? Um, and we don't know yet. Um, so that's something that will continue to accumulate our data 
and combine it with other data sets, because every time that telescopes bring new data to this, we can combine it with ours and think about it. Um, because especially after the discussion earlier, I want to show you something else we see in gamma rays that you may not expect. The moon and the sun. These images are, they're both on the same scale, there's a very faint one degree marker. So this is, um, you know, in, you know the, the scale of these is about like half a degree. Um, and so, so you see both of these images are about 10 degrees across, and they're done in sort of compatible scales, and no text that way. So in other words, one of these images is brighter than the other. The moon is brighter than the sun in gamma rays. It's not reflectance, it's because what we're seeing from the moon is not because of light, it's because of cosmic rays crashing into it. The same reason we see the galaxy. It's all about, and so the moon is brighter. It's closer. Um, and in fact, I had some, one of my colleagues made the measurement of how bright is the space station in gamma rays. Because cosmic rays run into everything. So everything that cosmic rays hit makes a gamma ray signature. That's, um, so you can calculate the, the space station, the asteroid fields, Jupiter. All of these things have a calculated gamma ray brightness. Yep. Um, so to give you some idea, because I keep talking about like, okay, well, this isn't hot stuff. We're seeing actually matter whizzing at near the speed of light. How does that happen? Um, this also kind of goes to Fermi's idea, although he didn't have it quite right. I've got a little animation of what happens to these charged particles when you have some expanding explosion, a pressure wave. Um, it tangles up magnetic fields that, that can then make these charged particles whiz around, but they're trapped. And they're trapped until they get energetic enough to break away. Um, and then they can go whizzing off into space. But at this point, they've built up a lot of energy because of how many times they've kind of crossed uh, those magnetic field regions. Um, and so that's kind of how this is happening. So when you're thinking about gamma rays, any place that has had some kind of explosive activity, um, any place that has some sort of complicated magnetic field that can get wrapped up and cause regions where things have to kind of cross into different regions of magnetic field strength on um, the different directions, then yeah. Um, and this was kind of, Fermi had sort of a loose idea that they would sort of ping pong ball back and forth between molecular claws. And that's not really, we have to have this sort of strong interaction. You have things that are kind of packed up because of this explosive shock wave. Um, and that actually brings it to the, um, gives you the um, kind of uh, the magnetic field strengths that can trap particles long enough to get them up to the highest energies. Um, so it's kind of cool. So we're seeing lots of evidence of things in the past that were pretty exciting, and I wouldn't want to admit it. So I love the Messier catalog uh, because I've spent a lot of time on its first object, um, as did apparently Charles Messier, because he, he was annoyed enough at the Crab Nebula for not being a comet that he created the Messier catalog. <laughs> Um, and I kind of admire that as a scientist. Um, so I want to talk about that because this is probably the most famous gamma ray object, the most famous of all astrophysics objects. I think it has more papers than any source uh, by maybe an order of magnitude. Um, so there's a beautiful <coughs> image of it. Now this is exactly that kind of explosion that I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, this was an explosion that happened in 1054, a supernova. Um, it was actually recorded by humans. Um, you see evidence of it both in accounts in Asia, as well as potentially in some drawings on, uh, that have been found in New Mexico and uh, in the Southwest. Um, so it's cool, we know how old it is. Often we don't know how old things are very precisely. We know how old this object is. Over time, it's been spreading out and expanding. You're seeing that expansion. It's um, you know, a fraction of, of a degree on the sky. Um, and you're seeing different colors, and that's actually from different elements that are coming out of that explosion. When you see that optical image with these kind of threading and the different colors, um, it's the different elements that were actually kind of um, produced and accelerated in that explosion and now are um, going out into space. Um, and it doesn't stay uniform because of all the complex things that go up in the explosion. You sort of get this, this threaded look to it, they call them filaments. Um, the other really famous thing about the Crab Nebula, which is when I started kind of coming back to astronomy roots, when I would try to observe it with these kind of big 10 meter optical gamma ray telescope dishes um, in, um, in Arizona. Um, you know, any, any ground based gamma ray astronomer knows about uh, one of the stars in Taurus because every time we try to look at the crab, they start turning off our really sensitive, fo you know, photon sensitive devices because of this bright star, Zeta Tau. Um, so that was, that's one of the few stars that I can name, in fact. <laughs> Um, anyway, so I'm showing you the finding chart up here in M1. So next time that you're looking at going to the Messier catalog and look at M1, um, remember that it's this really famous gamma ray object. Um, it's bright enough that most telescopes have used it to start to learn how their telescope works. It's been a calibration source for us in that sense, um, because you can see it from both the north and the south. 
um, for many facilities. Um, and you can see it across the entire spectrum. And so it's been a wonderful object for us to work on as astronomers. And for us, it's a blob. <laughs> However, it's a very interesting blob because we actually can tell you how big that blob is. And in gamma rays, we actually have measured the size of the Crab Nebula. So it's not beyond a resolving power, but it's at the limit of it. So I can't show you, you know, structures within it, but I can tell you how big it is, how, and which is important because the gamma rays aren't going to be the same size as the optical. They come from a different, um, a different mechanism. Um, and the crab, I said it was a calibration source, but it did something kind of crazy to us just a couple years into the mission that made us think, are we doing something wrong here? Because it changed brightness. You know, we, we sort of check sources and make sure that they're the same brightness because that's our way of calibrating ourselves, of comparing. Uh, and the crab changed dramatically. Um, and it changes dramatically, it turns out, sometimes very quickly. So you can take this object, look at it in our data, and sometimes within a few hours it has changed by you know, something like an order of magnitude. Um, so amazing object. I'm showing you in the map here, then, that same region of sky. And so you can see that this is our normal crab nebula. Um, there's a nearby friend that has that's the Galingo Pulsar, which is actually pretty, you know, one of the closest ones to, to Earth. Um, and then this flare state. So in normal, we're talking about what it looks like in sort of, you know, like a couple years of data. And the flare state, that's just over a couple days. It's really bright, noticeably brighter. Um, and this actually, made everyone a little bit scratch their heads because it was also brighter at higher energies than we thought we should see. Um, and so we've had to kind of rewrite that simple picture I showed you about those you know, particles bouncing back and forth in that shock wave. It doesn't work for this guy. Um, so we're actually looking at the kinds of processes that occur in our sun. So I've become better friends with my heliophysics friends uh, because there are processes that they use that might actually be the way that we get these gamma rays on such short time scales up to the energies that we see them. Um, so this has been another mystery that has come out of Fermi that we are still studying. Um, another thing that you can look at um, sometimes without too much equipment is stellar novae. Um, I imagine when the, several of the bright novae have gone off um, that you all might have turned your binoculars or your telescopes to them. Um, and this is the source that we never really expected to be a very prominent gamma ray source. We didn't talk about it before lunch, um, but it turns out it is. Um, and what's really cool is not only do we see both optical light and gamma rays from some novae, they have to be nearby, um, we don't see the ones that are further away in the gamma rays, and what I'm showing you here are two sets of data. The blue dots are optical data, and each of those is, you know, every, let's see, this is in day, so every day or so, and maybe several times a day for the blue dots, and then those black data points are the gamma ray data about every day. And the cool thing is, is the shape of those curves is pretty much the same. And people did not really expect that because the idea with Novi is that you have this flash that goes off, right? Um, you get a, a um, runaway from a nuclear explosion on the surface of this white dwarf star. And so the optical should all be coming from, from that um, you know, decay of the radioactive material, right? But the gamma rays I just showed you come from shocks. So those should be two separated things happening in different places at different times. Um, and so the fact that those, that black line dips down at the same time that those blue points dip down means that we've had no be wrong in optical. The optical light is actually coming from the shock um, and being reprocessed. So the gamma rays kind of got there first, and the shock things get processed down through x-ray to longer wavelengths to longer wavelengths, and then you get the optical. And we now have even a second event. I'm giving you a preview. There's a press release that's going to come out next month on a really exciting NOVA observation with a CubeSat and with Fermi data. And you just see this thing go up and down together, just in lockstep. Um, and the theorists have all kind of scrambled them to be like, oh, most of the optical power is actually coming from the shock and not from the radioactive decay. So this is another thing that we've learned. So if you look at NOVA, and especially if they're optically bright, I guarantee you that um, we will be seeing it in gamma rays. So keep that in mind for your, your future observing. I sort of mentioned that there's this Kaminga object, there's the crab object. The great thing about the pulsars is that we see enough of them to really do a lot of good scientific work. Um, and they're a lot of fun because they change in time in a predictable way. And you can do a lot of science with both what's happening with their strong magnetic field. That's what's represented by these white rings. Um, as well as they're also this kind of interesting gravitational object because it's a very, very dense star. The star stopped burning, it fell in on itself, 
parsed itself down into essentially being like a big ball of neurons. So you're left with a really strong magnetic field. You're left with a lot of angular momentum, so they spin fast. Um, and the cool thing is, is when they're spinning, then they blink when the emission that's, kind of, that's happening around the object is pointed at you. Um, the major thing that we found is a few of these you can observe in optical, maybe a handful. Uh, they're much more common in radio, uh, thousands of them. In gamma rays, though, we see a different view of them, and that's because we're actually seeing a different region around the star. That pink section is meant to represent these gamma rays are kind of coming out from this equator magnetic field. Well, the radio is kind of coming along this axis of the magnetic field, and so as it rotates around, we see very different things between the radio and the gamma rays. But when we put them together, it's kind of giving us more of this topography of what's going on around this really complex state of matter. Under the hood, what's going on in the magnetic field is these red and blue lines are showing you matter and antimatter, electrons and positrons that are essentially ripped off the surface of the neutron star. Um, and they get captured in this magnetic field as the pulse is twisting around, and that's what's making the radio and the gamma ray emission. And so this model that I'm showing was run um, recently on the supercomputers at NASA. So what's really fascinating to me is the level of data that we're now getting in the gamma rays um, and combining with other wavelengths is complicated enough that we actually need the equivalent of thousands of computers to make a model that is, is testing the limits of our data. Um, so this is a really important aspect of the work at NASA. Not only can we make these observations, but also we can go and really make the computers work for us to try and model the features and let us see what's going on inside these regions. Um, and also, since it's Women's History Month, this was run by Alice Harding's group at Goddard. Um, Alice Harding is a pioneer of high energy pulsars and was one of the first people working on this. Um, and so if you're looking for a, um, you know, someone for students to think about uh, for Women's History Month, I highly recommend looking at her work. She's still an active astronomer and doing amazing things. The gamma ray sky is very dynamic, if you haven't gotten that impression already. You, when you look at it, you don't always see the same stuff. In fact, something like, um, something like a third of the sky is changing all the time, a third of the objects in our catalog are dynamic. So in other words, when we go to look, we're not sure what brightness they're going to be. So, I can, so if I have to go and judge the, the seeing conditions using these, I'm going to have a hard time. Um, and I can show you this with uh, kind of a fun movie <coughs> that just shows you how that is. This is a projection of the northern and southern hemisphere split to kind of get that bright galactic plane out of the way. And you'll see all these red dots coming in. And these are real objects, they're distant. They're supermassive black holes, active galaxies that are far away from us, that flare up. Um, and so this was one of the reasons that Fermi was launched. We knew these were out there. We saw them with the previous instrument. We wanted to know how many, what type, are they all similar, are they different? And now we have several classes of this object that we've seen. We have thousands of them to work with. Um, and it's really changing our understanding of relativ the relativistic jets that are coming out of these supermassive black holes. So if you want to know how black holes form and how they live, the gamma rays tell you how they live. If they are eating, if they are doing something, the gamma rays are giving you that information. Um, so that's the major role that we play with black hole science. Okay, so, so I mentioned supermassive black holes, so I have to show you the pictures. So what is inside here? It's dark now because they have this ring, this dusty ring around them, around the outside. So if you were looking at the supermassive black hole edge on like that, you wouldn't see a lot, it would block the optical light. However, if it tips more towards you, you see x-rays, you see optical light, um, and you see this very bright region. That's where the gamma rays come from, this bright beam that's coming out. It's the energy that's released as things fall into that black hole. Um, and so this is one of the reasons that um, the sky is so exciting for us, because that by its nature is very dynamic. Um, now, you know, how do we know about these if we're just kind of looking down this like, beam of radiation? Um, well, some of them we get to study at a different angle, so I want to show you another optical object. Anyone like galaxies? The Centaur A, NGC 5120. I, I was happy to see NGC on one of the slides earlier. I'm like, oh, we know that catalog. Um, yeah, so this is known in optical, and you can kind of see there's sort of this dusty lane. Um, there's some brightness, there's stars there, okay. Uh, it's kind of nice. I'm not so familiar with the optical properties because in gamma rays, it's kind of amazing. You remember that big red smudgy thing we looked at at the beginning of the talk that covered like, you know, 10 degrees of sky? Yeah, that is what it looks like in gamma rays. We're not looking at the center of that galaxy, we're looking at these huge low structures. So it's kind of like you took that 
those jets from that super blast, massive black hole, had them fill up with energy in the space around it. And then, but instead of looking down that jet, you're looking at it from the side on view, so you can actually see the projection. That purple glow is the region in the gamma rays. Um, and it's truly spread out, um, far outside kind of the bounds of how you would use the stars to define the galaxy. Um, it's gorgeous radiation. And we know this also because our friends in radio, this is one, you know, this is an amazing source on the sky for them. Um, it also covers you know, 10 degrees of sky. You have these huge radio lobes, and it's for the same reason that you see here. It's filled with electrons, relativist electrons, that are throwing off radio emission, and it turns out that, you know, if you think space is empty, but it's full of all kinds of stuff. I told you it's filled with cosmic rays. It's also filled with the cosmic microwave background. But it turns out when you have electrons running into the cosmic microwave background, they make gamma rays. So I will show you one more optical tour object, and this is the gamma ray bursts. These are the most powerful things we see. We see them from across the universe. I've been talking about things like Centaurus A is something like 12 million light years away. Um, gamma ray bursts are billions of light years away. We see them um, almost as far as we can see galaxies. They're some of the most distant things we see. Um, the movie I'm showing you here, you'll see a bright spot that shows up in the center. This is the Booties region. Um, and there are folks who look for flashes of optical light that happen over hours, days, and go away. Um, and you can see gamma ray bursts in optical light. It's often hard to catch that because it's hard to have a really big, sensitive optical telescope that can pick those out. Um, but this group followed up and caught it based on the detection of gamma rays. Um, and this one was actually a naked, it was called the naked eye burst. Um, and I think it reached a magnitude of something like five. So every now and then you get a gamma ray burst that's so bright that you could actually go out in your backyard and see it. Um, and so I want to show you what it looks like in gamma rays. Um, this purple ring kind of is our whole field of view. The big oval is the whole sky. There's a dark region, and then this kind of blue region coming in. That blue region is the Earth blocking our view. So we don't like that, but we have to live with it because it's easier to talk to the Earth when you're close to it. Um, so watch, this is going to loop again, but watch. Because what you're looking for, that green bar you see moving is the center of our field of view. It's going to come back around. All right, here it comes back around. And so kind of watch near the center. So watch here. And then you're going to see things moving, a flash. Boom. That was the gamma ray burst. And we put it in the center of our field of view. But you see all this snow coming in from the Earth? That's because the Earth's atmosphere makes a lot of gamma rays. Um, and so that kind of blocks you. But this was cool because it actually happened in our field of view. And then we slew it over to watch it more closely. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like if you were going to, you know, just look at gamma rays coming into the instrument. They're just like dip, 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 going off like fireworks all the time. Um, and it, it's also to kind of explain the reason we can see the whole sky is we're scanning over it over time. It takes us about three hours to get the full picture. Um, now the gamma ray bursts, we're kind of back to talking about jets again. Um, so where are the gamma rays coming from? We have this huge uh, flow of energy. Because when there's a gamma ray burst, this has been either a star that has obliterated itself or some um, stellar merger that has happened of compact objects. In either case, the energy release is huge. Um, and so it gets routed. Um, and usually things are rotating. Usually there's a preferred direction. It gets beamed out in this jet. Um, the cool thing is the gamma rays come early. So why are gamma ray bursts named after gamma rays? The gamma rays are the first signal you get. They come early on as this wave of energy is flowing out and building up shocks. Particles get caught. Later on, you can actually see it across most of the spectrum. And so that's where we kind of do an all play and try and use all the wavelengths together to understand how this develops, what it means for the energy, what it means for what the original object was, and how we can use this to study populations of stars across the history of the universe. Um, so I just, this is one, pretty much my last slide, um, because this is one of the most important things that we've been able to do with Fermi, is we saw a gamma ray burst, but it was a very special gamma ray burst because also it was the first time that gravitational waves were detected from a neutron star merger, or two neutron stars, <coughs> which the same neutron star that um, when I was talking about the pulsars earlier, the big ball of neutrons, there are lots of these. A lot of times they're in pairs. So earlier you were talking about um, uh, a stellar binary. 
Um, and so maybe you all know better than high energy astronomers that a lot of stars come in pairs. Um, they also can die in pairs. And you can end up with actually two dead stars that are in orbit. When they come together, they can form a black hole because now suddenly they're too dense to be neutron stars anymore. When they come together, it disrupts everything and collapse into a black hole. But when you do that, energy is released. Um, so you get this, then these beautiful events where we've seen one of these so far. And this is the era of gravitational wave um, detection has just started in the past few years. Um, but what you're seeing here is this signal of the gravitational wave rising in frequency, that kind of infamous chirp that goes off. And then up at the top, you see this blue spike that comes up. And those are the gamma rays. And so independently, Fermi and LIGO saw these. And then they started talking to each other because LIGO had sort of some junk in their data. And Fermi said, hey, you know, we saw a burst. And they were like, oh, we better clean that data real fast. <laughs> and, so, um, and so it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was amazing because that time difference between those signals is real. That's physics. From the time when you stop seeing the gravitational waves, you get a new object, energy is released, physics is happening, up until the point where that huge jet forms and the gamma rays get out, but all in two seconds. So it's amazing, and you have to do a lot of physics uh, to figure that out, and we're all having a lot of fun with that. So let me show you in the movie of what's going on, uh, where you have this kind of beautiful illustration of the explosion expanding and running into the material around it and glowing. Um, we talk about afterglows with bursts, and that's really what's happening. And the energy goes out, but it doesn't just go forever. It starts slowing down, and more energy gets dumped. Um, so I want to leave you then with one fun thing to take away for um, your outreach. I said earlier we have um, like 5,000 sources in the gamma ray sky now. At the point we had 3,000, we said, hey, there are about 3,000 or so stars that are at um, uh, or visible, I think, with the naked eye, something like that. And, and so what, why can't we have constellations? So these are completely unofficial. IAU does not <laughs> sanction these. Um, but we made gamma ray constellations for all of our favorite things and to highlight some of the differences in the gamma ray sky. Uh, I love this. It's got Godzilla. Yeah. Japan was so excited about this that it was huge in their media to the point that the guy who plays Bruce Banner saw it, saw also that the Hulk was in there and was like tweeting about her. <laughs> but this is just showing one view, but there's a lot of fun stuff. There is Schrodinger's cat, uh, our own satellite, the TARDIS. But every object, we had the requirement that every object had to have a real connection to gamma ray astrophysics. So each one has a story, and if you go and click on the name, it tells you the story of that object and gives you some of the science background. Um, let's see, we have some things, you know, you see, like, why is the Colosseum in there? Italy was a critical partner for Fermi. Um, and so we have things representing our partners. We have the little prince for France. We have the, the Eiffel Tower. We have the Colosseum. We have a famous cathedral from our castle from Germany, another important partner. I think we have the Vasa from Sweden because they were another important partner. That is the TARDIS. That is the TARDIS, yeah. And there's a lot of fun things on the other side. Some of them are, are closer to, like, for example, we have a spider in there for a type of pulsar that we see, things like that. Yeah. Is Schrodinger's cattle out of breath? <laughs> yeah, so I will leave I will leave you to observe and change, <laughs> and change the state of it. Yeah.